Pasqualina Albano Siniscalci Miranda was called the bootleg queen of Little Italy in Springfield, Massachusetts during Prohibition. She was one of the earliest gangsters in Springfield to have connections with the New York families. The Springfield crew in Massachusetts today are part of the Genovese crime family, run by the New Jersey faction. But while they're controlled by New Jersey, the local personnel overwhelmingly trace their lineage to a handful of towns in the Neapolitan countryside, mostly from Brasigliano, where Pasqualina was born, and Quindici, the neighboring town on the other side of the provincial border in Avellino, where her first husband, Carlo Siniscalci, was born. Fans of The Sopranos may remember that the fictional New Jersey crime family is originally from Avellino, which is near Naples. In Season 2, Episode 4, Tony Soprano travels to Italy, where he deals with a distant cousin, Annalisa Zucca, who is the boss, in all but name, of her Camorra family. In reality, women like Pasqualina have sometimes taken over their illicit family businesses, but few are remembered for their active roles in this all-male society of the Mafia. The bootleg queen is one notable exception. Pasqualina Albano was born in Brasigliano in April 1890, the second child and first daughter of Luigi Albano and Francesca Izzo. Sometime before her 10th birthday, Pasqualina's family immigrated to Springfield, Massachusetts, and settled in the South End, Little Italy. Her father, Luigi, was a grocer. Sometime after the 1910 census, her mother died and her father remarried. Three days later, Pasqualina, who was 21, married for the first time to Carlos Siniscalci, a saloon keeper from Brooklyn. They settled on Water Street, which was the main thoroughfare through Little Italy, or what was often called the Italian colony in newspapers of the time. Either Carlo changed jobs a lot, or was not entirely honest about his profession in official forms, because the Brooklyn saloon keeper went on to own a candy store in Springfield, and a few years after that, he claims to work for a macaroni factory. When Prohibition began in January of 1920, Carlo was immediately renowned as the king of the bootleggers in Springfield's Little Italy. Things were looking good for the Siniscalci family. Pasqualina and Carlo moved into a bigger place. Their fifth child, a daughter named Gloria, was born the following year in October. But three months later, in December 1921, Carlo had a falling out with one of his alcohol distributors. Joseph Parisi, didn't pay Carlo what he owed, so the bootleg king cut him off. When Parisi protested, Carlo insulted him, slapped him across the face, and ordered him off Water Street. So Parisi found Carlo in traffic at the corner of Union in Maine and shot him there in his car. It seems to me that Carlo wasn't all that well-liked, and not only because Parisi killed him in broad daylight, but because of how the story of Carlo's death exaggerates his wealth. A local historian told a reporter that Carlo Siniscalci was killed in the back seat of his limo, waiting for his chauffeur to return with cigars. But the newspapers of the time, reporting on the crime and the subsequent trial for Joseph Parisi, report that in fact Carlo was driving himself that day, and that he was alone. Parisi would later testify that Carlo was holding a gun in his lap and threatened to kill him. Parisi fired his own gun five times, killing Siniscalci and injuring an innocent bystander who was riding on a passing streetcar. Barely two years into Prohibition, and the king is dead. But if the story ended here, I would have called this the bootleg king of Springfield's Little Italy. From all the evidence, it appears that his queen, Pasqualina Albano Siniscalci, continued to run his bootlegging operations until her death in 1932. Before Carlo was killed, his nephew, Theodore Vona, was arrested in a liquor raid in a store on Water Street, and Carlo was arrested for threatening a police officer. After Carlo's murder, Parisi was arrested. The next summer, Theodore, who lived with the Siniscalci family, took his aunt Pasqualina's car 
from his private garage and went after Parisi's family in a drive-by shooting, firing on the man's wife, attorney, brother-in-law, and four-year-old nephew, who were all on their way back from visiting Joseph in prison. The Parisi family lived in West Springfield, but they also had relations over the Connecticut border in Weathersfield. Parisi's lawyer told the press at the time that he believed the target of the shooting was Joseph Marvici, Parisi's brother-in-law. Marvici was killed in another drive-by shooting two months later. By 1924, Pasqualina remarried to Antonio Miranda, who was, coincidentally, another saloon keeper from Brooklyn. Antonio is the brother of Mike Miranda, a longtime consigliere of the Genovese crime family. The Miranda brothers are from San Giuseppe Vesuviano, in the same part of Naples as Brasigliano and Quindici. Before they met, Antonio lived with his brother in New York's Little Italy. He went to Sing Sing in 1915 for carrying an unlicensed firearm. Through his brother, Antonio is connected to bootleggers in New York, Frank Costello and Vito Genovese, who were working with Charlie Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Siegel. In 1922, this gang joined the crime family of Giuseppe, Joe the Boss, and Masseria. In Springfield, Antonio and Pasqualino were regarded as leaders of the Italian community. Antonio was known as a wealthy but discreet real estate agent. Miranda had such a low profile that when he died suddenly from a blood infection, the response from his community took the city by surprise. Tens of thousands of dollars in floral tributes poured in. Remember, this is 1930. Mourners came from all over. There were dozens of cars in the funeral procession, many of them just for carrying flowers to the cemetery. Pasqualina rented an airplane, which dropped even more flowers onto the cars. The number and demeanor of the men who came to pay their respects, and the distances that they traveled to do so, were such that the newspaper reporters in Springfield all wanted to know who had Antonio Miranda been and who were his friends. I imagine that along with evaluating their impressions of Antonio Miranda, locals must have also been reconsidering their opinions of Pasqualina. After all, the late Mr. Miranda had been married to the widow of the bootleg king. Just before Antonio died, the family had moved into this impressive home at 843 Chestnut Street. Pasqualina, 40 years old and twice widowed, now had six children. She continued to be an active bootlegger. Prohibition wouldn't end until 1933, but she would not live to see its repeal. On the night of the 12th of November, 1932, Pasqualina was sitting in a parked car with Michael Fiore. Michael is the brother of Vincent Fiore, who was married to Pasqualina's sister, Annie. The Fiore brothers were also from the Naples area, from Mercado San Severino. Vincent was a barber, and Michael was like Pasqualina's first husband in that his recorded profession changes frequently with the public record. First he's a seaman, then he's a baker. Uh, he worked as an enforcer at an illegal card game. Uh, from the time he arrived in the U.S., Michael had spent more time in prison than out. He was fresh from the prison in Weathersfield, Connecticut that night, a few blocks from Pasqualina's home. Pasqualina and Michael were sitting in her car when another car came down the street and sprayed them with gunfire. Michael was injured, but Pasqualina was killed. She was laid to rest in St. Michael's Cemetery in Springfield, alongside both of her late husbands. Initially, the newspapers described Pasqualina as an innocent bystander, with Fiore being the intended target of the shooting. But the tenor of the reporting would change again the following spring, when in April Michael was shot to death in a barber shop. The coverage of his murder, also in broad daylight, calls Michael a trusted lieutenant of Mrs. Pasqualina Miranda, Springfield's bootleg queen, who was murdered last November. A couple days after Michael's death, it was reported that, while he was a patient in the hospital, recovering from the 1932 shooting, he made atheistic statements. As a result, Michael was buried in unconsecrated ground in the same cemetery with the bootleg queen.